In 2006, the movie called The Guardian came out, and it was uh, for Hollywood, not a bad, not a bad movie. It's, it's always dicey as a pastor when you say that a, a movie's good, um, because it's like, well, did you remember this? Every movie is bad, so let's just put it that way, all right? This is not an endorsement, but I like this movie. Um, it was a story that was about a top rescue swimmer for the United States Coast Guard, who was played by Kevin Costner, and he is getting old, and he is forced to either retire or go and teach at a rescue swimmer school. And so he chooses to go to this school where he meets a gentleman named Jake Fisher, who was played by Ashton Kutcher, and he is a top candidate of, uh, of this swim rescue school. He could have been an Ivy League swimmer, he was an outstanding swimmer, but he goes in, and I'm not going to give you all the details, but what happens at the end of the training is Kevin Costner asks his class two questions that are great questions, and I want to ask them to you, and I want to show you the video clip. Class 5506, will you come find me if I am lost? Yes, yes, yes. Will you come save me if I am drowning? Yes, Mr. Chief! I believe you would. I have high hopes for this class. I have high hopes for you. What a great question. Will you come and find me if I'm lost? Will you come and save me if I'm drowning? In a real sense, that's the question that our passage is asking us this morning. So let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. We enter our final chapter in the book of Galatians. It's page 1,239 in your pew Bibles. And I really encourage you to turn there. Now, I want to give you, I just want to back up to the beginning and just remind you of what we have gone through in this book. Paul is writing to counter false teachers. He is, he is writing to, to those who have uh, started to embrace a bad gospel. And Jesus warned, after I leave, there's going to be false sheep that are, false shepherds that are going to come in and they're going to ravage the, the flock. And really at, at the basis of what is going on is the core question of, how do we get to heaven? How does one get into heaven? And there was this group called the Judaizers that said, yes, faith in Jesus is great, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You had to add to it circumcision. And, and Paul, right in chapter 1, jumps on this, and he says in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And then he says this, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Let him, let him be damned. And so there is a strong statement that he makes. And can I just say, there are false gospels that are being preached today and really nothing, nothing has changed. And so... Really, for four chapters, Paul makes his argument of why it is by faith alone in Christ alone that we have eternal life. And, and he talks about his background. And, and so four chapters of that. And then he warns that after he, after he tells everybody that there is freedom in Christ, that you are called to live free in Christ and, and to live godly, he also gives a warning. He says, be careful be careful that you do not let your freedom become a license to sin. We, we do have to be careful of that. It's so easy to have a cheap grace to say, well, I'm forgiven, I can do whatever I want. And, and no, we can't. If, if you're a true believer, what are we called to do? And we looked at this. We're called to walk by the Spirit. We're called to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we spent a week talking about that. And then just to make sure that we were clear... Paul had laid out what the works of the flesh are, and we spent a week talking about this. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, 
sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you recall, when we preached to that, had a great big pile of garbage over here, and we had, a, we had a bag of garbage over here because that was the week when the Supreme Court made its decision. And, and the issue was sin is sin. And we, and we have to call it as it is. And that is, the, that is the works of the flesh. And they are quite evident. And then last week, Pastor Jason talked about and preached through the fruit of the Spirit that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we're going to take those and... In the fall, we're going to go, by those, go through those one at a time as we go through, um, go through those slowly. And so that's a review, and here we are. We come into chapter 6. Let me invite you, grab your Bibles, and please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able. And I want to just back up a couple of uh, verses to verse 25, and so we can get a little bit of the context of chapter uh, 5, verse 25, and then we're going to continue on. It says, If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then let his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help us to hear what your word says and help us to apply it. And Lord, help us to be the people that you want us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want us to go through this passage, and uh, there's several things that, that we want to see in this. And the first one is this. What are Christians called to do, and why do we hesitate? I think if we get this right, if, if you get nothing out of today, if you get this point, and the importance of this point, you'll be good. You'll be We'll be, we'll be better off than when we walked in here. Starts off, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, brothers. He's, he's basically saying, believers, brothers and sisters. It would be like me saying to you, my brothers and sisters. I mean, this is a passionate plea. He says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, in any sin, so we see who this is to, this this is to all of us. If anyone is caught, and that idea is you are snared in a snare of sin or caught in sin yourself. If anyone is caught in any transgression. Notice that this is not just biggies. This is, uh, this is if, if we see our brother or sister doing something that is not biblical, in any way. Now, we understand. We don't, we don't have mortal and venial sins, but there are sins that are huge and have big effect, and there are sins that are huge in God's eyes, but in human eyes, they're not as big. Can we just acknowledge that? In other words, um, I cheat on my wife, big sin, big problem. If I, uh, if I speed and disobey the law, hmm, Compare the two. I mean, you do this one, so do I, every week, all right? This one, I'm hoping none of us are doing. But anytime we come up to a known sin, and and as the Bible lays it out, uh, what does the Scripture say? Brothers, if anyone is caught in any sin. Why Why do we do this? Why? Because there is... The, the snowball effect, something that can start, a, a little area of rebellion starts here. It's, it's like, ah, it's no big deal. But let me tell you, if we don't help each other, catch each other right here, 
that, that little snowball becomes a massive snowball and it becomes an avalanche and then you have horrible problems over here. No one goes from starting off wanting to glorify God in the moment to blowing up their life like that. It is a, it's a progression and so we, we catch each other, we help each other. And when it says, you who are spiritual, this is one that I have talked to dozens of people about this and they say, who am I to confront somebody? I'm not spiritual. I mean, what do I know? I'm just, a, I'm just a new believer. I don't know a whole lot. Can, can I tell you? Yes, you do. Let me tell you a story what happened. I got permission to tell the story. We have a guy that comes to Monday night Bible study, and I encourage all the men to come out to that. Um, Ken comes in last Monday night, and he tells us a story. He says, Pastor, and we started the class this way. He says, let me tell you what happened. He gets up, and he tells a story. He took his grandkids to Dave and Buster's. And uh, you get a little band and you can ride all the rides you want. And those bands are $25 a piece. So he buys his two grandkids these bands. They go and the kids say, well, we don't want to do the rides. Now, Ken is cheap. And he's like, I just wasted $50. They don't want to do any rides. So he goes back to the counter. The counter says, no refunds. Ken says, um, I, I just got a call, my mother-in-law's sick, and um, can I get our money back? The guy said, oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. He cuts the tags off, gives him his 50 bucks back. Walking out the door, Ken's 12-year-old granddaughter looks at him and says, Grandpa, you just lied. And he blew it off, and he blew it off. And yet the Holy Spirit was after him. Now, in that moment... Who was spiritual? The 12-year-old granddaughter who didn't know much compared to grandpa who knew a lot. Now the men counseled Ken. Ken, we made him <laughs> go out, repent to his granddaughter, go back to Dave and Buster's, give, explain the whole situation, give him 50 bucks. And, and I talked to him yesterday and he said, it's the best thing I've ever done. And I just thank God for his 12-year-old granddaughter who said, Grandpa, you just lied. And, and, and you look at that, it's like, that's how we should, we should be as brothers and sisters. We should so love and care for each other that we don't allow this, this to happen. And it doesn't matter how you get caught into sin. Can, can I just give you a little a newsflash here? There is no one here that is perfect. We all stumble in many ways, and the scripture is very clear. Do not give the devil a foothold. And, and I know how it happens. Spiritual dullness happens when there's, when there's not prayer, when there's not time in God's word, when there's no real accountability. We can, we can start to compromise. We can start to rationalize the most ungodly behavior. And I've seen it happen with pastors, and I've seen it happen with people that are brand new believers. And in my 34 years of walking with Jesus, typically Christians handle these kind of things three ways. One of them is um, someone who's caught in a sin. That we are, and sometimes, we are like the Pharisees and the scribes in John 8, with the women caught in a, a woman caught in adultery in the very act, they bring her to Jesus and they describe the law and what should we do? And, and Jesus says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone and they went away, the oldest to the first. So there's sometimes there's this uh, hypervigilant, you know, I can't believe you did this. Look what this person did. Let's stone them approach. And then there's the other approach that says, hey, you know, who am I to deal with this? And let's sweep this right under the carpet. And that, that sweeping underneath the carpet happens for a great many way, uh, reasons. Sometimes it's the whole thing of, well, you know, judge not lest you be judged. And I'm not perfect. And who am I to call this person on the, on the carpet? And uh, why, who am I to judge? And yet we, we have scriptures that you who are spiritual... We're, we're to do that. We're to, to restore in a spirit of gentleness. And so people won't do it, and they will stray away, and they won't do the hard thing. 
And then there are those who, who follow the biblical pattern and they restore gently. I am so thankful for the people in my life over my years as a believer who have loved me enough to when they see me start to go down a wrong path, gently come beside me and call me back. Call me back to obedience. Call me back to living for the glory of Jesus Christ. And that, that's how it should work. Here, here's how it should work. We're all stumblers. I can be the biggest idiot in the room right now. I can tell you that. I just flat out can. And, um, and so can you in any given moment. And, and so we need each other uh, to lovingly care for each other that when we're in the swamp of sin and rebellion and self-centeredness, that we will love each other enough to jump in and help each other out and, and to endeavor to be instruments in God's hands to restore one another. We have to do this. The reason that the Christian church across America is a joke is because we don't deal with sin. We're, we're not a righteous people. And, and the reason we're not is because if I have an attitude that's going sideways, as a pastor or as a new believer, someone needs to come alongside with me and say, brother, sister, you bring it around. What does God's word say on the issue? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of things that happen in your life, but we still have to turn into it and handle it the right way. If you don't, as a believer, you will walk through life in a miserable state. There's nothing worse than a true Christian walking in disobedience to the God he says he loves. There's nothing more miserable. There is no joy. There is no peace. There is no kindness. There's, I mean, there's no fruit of the Spirit that's there. And so we, as God's people, brothers and sisters, fellow strugglers need to do this. Now, second point. What if they don't want it? What, what if they don't want or care to be rescued? This is tough. And by the way, I'm telling you right now, this is going to happen. There are people who are going to be drowning in their, in their sin and uh, self-centeredness, and, and you're going to go to want to rescue them, and uh, they don't want it. If you have ever taken a life-saving course, they'll, they will teach you that if you're going to go save someone, that you have to be careful because people that are drowning often are thrashing in the water and they're going crazy. And if you come, come up to rescue them, they will, in their desperation, grab you and push you under so they can reach up and get air. And so you have to be very careful how you approach it. And so they'll say, you know, come behind them or, or send them something. Give them, give them something for them to, to hold on to. But you have to be very careful. In the movie, The Guardian, that was one of the tests where someone comes up and they grab, grab the person and, and, and at the end there's this one guy who finally has to pop the guy in the nose and get free in order to rescue him. Now I wish, and this sounds terrible, I wish I could jump in when someone's you know, uh, swimming around in the swamp of sin, smack him in the nose and drag him out. But you can't do that spiritually. I mean that would be, wouldn't it be great though? It would be, it would be that easy. I mean saving someone in the water is a piece of cake, kind of. I've never done it. But um, but the principles are kind of cut and dry. Even if you've got to knock the dude out, you get him out of there. You do what you can. And in, in a real sense, we as God's people, um, we have to love them enough to do the hard thing. But there will be times when people will say, leave me alone. And Jesus has addressed this. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, is the process of church discipline, which we do here, Thankfully, we don't have to do it a lot, but here's what it says in Matthew 18, it's in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault just between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he refuses to listen, take two or three others along that every matter may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, Treat them as you would a, a, a Gentile or a tax collector. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about expel the wicked man from among you. And this is, this is hard to do, but this is the tough love that we need to do. In James chapter 5, it says, My brothers, 
If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him who know that whoever brings back a sinner from the wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. If you truly love someone, you will do what you can to rescue them. Are you going to let someone drown because you might lose their friendship? Really? I mean, and this is, this is where people will go, mm, but who am I to judge? And, and we will rationalize it away. And I'm just saying, we, we have to go all in. We have to love each other enough to do the hard thing. And, and often it is unloving. If you let me drown, if you let me drown and you say you love me and you don't confront me and you see me doing something that's not right, you don't love me. You don't love me. You love yourself. You love your little comfort. If, you, if you're not, if you don't love me enough to come to me in love. Now we're going to talk about how we come to people in a minute. But please tell me you're going to love me enough that if I'm drowning, you're going to come and rescue me. Even if I swing at you and I try to drown you. I mean, that's what family does. That's what we do. That's what the church is called to do. And here's newsflash, people. We're all going to be in that swamp every now and then. Self-included. I'm so thankful that I have brothers and sisters that, because I don't want to be in there. I know if I go in there, there's massive effects if I'm there for a long time. And so we, we do need each other. Now, God's rescue swimmers, and that's what you are, God's rescue swimmers, swimmers are given special warnings. He says, brothers, if someone who is caught in a sin, in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. We're going to see this all through this context. We need to be very, very humble. Um, we need to be very careful, but gentleness needs to be approached because we've all been there before. We all struggle in many ways. And he says, keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. And I think that that temptation is diverse and different for different people. But I think you have to go into this prayerfully. You have to go into it carefully. You have to not go into this off the, off the cuff. We have to be wise in how we do it. Because we ourselves, I mean, if you're struggling, do you want to get hit with a baseball bat or do you want someone to lovingly come alongside you? Now, at the end of the day, you might need the baseball bat, but you, you want the loving approach that, that comes to you. In verse 2, it says, Brother, or, or bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. A, a Christian is a servant, and we are to help one another. And sometimes that help means that we help. It's easy to help someone. Oh, can I help you carry something? That's an easy one. Helping someone move, that's a little harder, but a lot of you will do that. Helping someone when they're in the swamp of sin, ooh, that's, that's Pastor Jason's job. That's Pastor Matt's job. That's, that's for the elders. I'll let them do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay out of that one. No, we carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, the principle of love. There is so much talk in the world about Christians need to love, Christians need to love, and I'm saying, you're right. And, and doing the tough love and the hard love is what we are called to do. He says, and then verse 3 through five, through 5 seem almost strange and out of place, but they're really not. He says, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And again, at first glance, it's like, well, what's that all about? And I think there is a real sense where he is, he is calling you to examine yourself as a burden carrier that you have to be very careful. He is giving a warning on, on our attitude and a, and a warning against pride. It's not like, oh, there goes Mr. and Mrs. Dumbo back into the, you know, into the swamp of sin. They're so stupid. Why, why are they doing that? No, there, there's none of that. We are to, we are to guard ourselves. And, and our first responsibility is to examine ourselves. Matthew chapter 7, it, and people always quote 7 1 Judge not lest you be judged. Everybody knows that verse, including unbelievers. But if you read the entire context and the, and the entire chapter, there is, there is a warning that we are to help each other, but there's a warning with that. 
that we're to take the, play, the log out of our own eye. In Matthew 7, 5, it says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We are called to help each other pull out specks out of each other's eyes. But we need to also be looking in the mirror every day to make sure that we don't have it in our own eyes. And so that there is a sense where we look at ourselves, where we have a proper understanding of who we are, that we're not boasting. Tim Keller has said this. And by the way, this is not a picture of Tim Keller. I don't know who that guy is. Um, Tim Keller's bald, but that's okay. Um, I love this quote. Religion makes us proud of what we have done. The gospel makes us proud of what Jesus has done. Isn't that great? Whenever whenever we're prideful, that's that's on us. Because what good, and can I just say this? Many of you do many great things. I'm so thankful for you. You do a lot. You do a lot for the kingdom. You do a lot to help people. There's a lot of things that you do. But what do you do that the Lord hasn't done through you? I mean, really? Really? We, we, it's the Lord that does it. It's the Lord. Who, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You were once lost. You were once dead in your transgressions and sins. And he made you alive in Christ. He grabbed you and, and put you on the solid footing. And sometimes you dive back into the swamp of sin. And the very fact that, the very fact that I'm right now not cheating on my wife and, and, and endeavoring to live for the glory of God is because he has done a work. And so let him who boast boast in the Lord. Then verse 5 he says, uh, for each will have to bear his own load. And John Stott has said this well. He says, there is one burden that we cannot share, and that is our responsibility to God on the day of judgment. On that day, you cannot carry my pack, you cannot carry my burden, and I cannot carry yours. Just a simple reminder. There is going to come a day when you will face King Jesus. It's going to happen. And for the believer, it is going to be for reward or loss, that judgment. But we we come to him and and we have to be careful. So how do we do this? I mean, this is so basic that we have to love each other and, and care for each other. How do we do this? We do this best. God's rescue team works best when you are in community. The very fact that I showed that video, you can't do life solo. You know, you just can't. You can't water ski by yourself. You just can't do that. Hard, hard to hold a party by yourself. And by no means can you do life by yourself. We desperately need each other. And, and the whole thing of just, you know what? I, you know, everyone else is stupid and I'm over here by myself. You know what? Yeah, no, you, you can't do that. If you do, uh, you're in trouble. The musk ox, I always love this. They have, a, they have a scene of this at Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitters. Um, and, and, it's, and it's beautiful because they're, they're protecting, they're, they're shoulder to shoulder protecting each other. And I think there's a sense in which we have to do this. Um, I always use this illustration because it's so true. The briquette will, that will get coldest the quickest is the one that's away from others. We are with each other to help each other we are there to be, as Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. And bad company corrupts good character. And I could go on and on. And so you surround yourself with people that will force you to, to do better. And in a real sense, that will love you enough. Again, I just say, will, you love, will we love each other enough that when we're acting the part of the fool, that we will gently come alongside and the earlier you do that, the easier it is. The difficult thing is by the time it gets to Pastor Jason and myself, sometimes that little snowball has become this massive thing. And so we, we've talked about core groups. There are many core groups. And people say, what are core groups? And, and how do you sign up for those? There is no sign up. But here's what you do. You look around, and many of you are in them and you don't even know them. Know what I mean? I'm saying you get together with three or four people that you're iron sharpening iron. And whether you get together once a week, once every other week, once a month, you get with a group, guys with guys, girls with girls, you get together and you check on, how are you doing? How's your marriage going? How's your attitude going? 
What, what current sins are you struggling with? I mean, let's talk. And then different, there's a bunch of groups that are going on. And uh, they're doing different things with different groups. And that's great. We need to be iron sharpening iron. We have to be doing that. And so you say, well, how do I start it? Well, you start it. You look around. Hopefully you have a friend. If not, make one. And then you say, hey, can we meet together once every other week? And just start doing it. If I, if I orchestrated it and said, okay, we're going to have you do this, I would have the same amount that are doing it if, if I didn't. So go out. Many of you are doing it. Go out and, and do it. Get together. Um, and, and I just want to encourage that. We're going to keep pushing that as much as we can. I, I ask the question, do you have people in your life that can speak into your life and do you listen? That's the real question. Do you listen? And I'm not talking about your spouse on this one because there's certain things people say, well, I, got, I have my spouse. Well, that's great. My spouse is my best friend. That's great. But what if you and your spouse got an issue? Who's flying by? Who's, who's helping you? And so you, we all need to have people. So I want to end with my clip again, and um, I, I hope you get it. Class 5506, will you come find me if I am lost? Yes, I need you, Chief! Will you come save me if I am drowning? Yes, I need you, Chief! I believe you would. I have high hopes for this class. I have high hopes for you. I have high hopes for you. I really do. That, that God will work in at least a couple of your lives. Because here's what I know. Right now, there are some of you, and you might not even know it, but the devil has a foothold on your life. And um, there's stuff going on. Everything from pornography all the way to bitterness. It, it doesn't matter. There's people who just say, nobody knows, and I could, there's my own little secret sin. You know what? The God of the universe that knows everything, knows what's going on. And so, let people speak into your life and listen. And if you know you're struggling, and, and there's some people who like, the reason I don't get close to people is because I don't want them to point out that I'm in that. May I just say to you, humble yourself before the Lord. Find somebody. Find somebody. And Pastor Jason and I will help in any way we can. But we need to be a people who love each other enough that when we're there, when we're swimming in the swamp of sin, that we will love each other enough to come and help us. Let's stand, and I want us to pray Father, I come before you and I thank you for your word, how amazingly practical it is that you have, you have ordained that your church function in a way that is so wise. Lord, none of us can live alone. None of us can, can do life alone. We do need the body of Christ. We need one another. I pray right now for the person who is, who is drowning in the swamp of sin and disobedience and maybe doesn't care right now. I pray that you would cause a brother or sister to come around that person and reach out and, and love them enough to let them know that what they're doing is not right. Lord, that, that marriages would be made better and restored, that there would be um, freedom from bitterness, that addictions to different things would be dealt with. So Lord, do your work in our lives. Make us bold lovers of people that we would care enough to care for people. So Lord, do it, we pray. May we not uh, tolerate sin in our own lives and may we love each other enough to... Um, to care enough for people, and may we do it for your glory. Lord, only one life that we have will soon be passed, but only what we do for Jesus will last. And help us to be in the center of your will.
you're here today and you know you're in that swamp of sin, you don't need to raise your hand. But will you just tell God and just cry out right now, say, help, Lord. In your, in your own heart, you don't need to say it out loud. Just say, help. Father, you know every heart and you know those that need help. And so uh, may, may we reach out and be your rescue swimmers. And may you do your work that you always do. We want to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.